The Origin of the Buddha's Thought by Tian Kong Tran, Ph.D. Section 1. Suffering and the Cessation of Suffering The Buddha was born in 563 BC in northern India, near Nepal, left the house life to go into homelessness when he was 29 years old, attained enlightenment when he was 35, passed away in 483 BC. He was a son of King Suddhodana. When he was five days old, he was named Siddhartha. His last name was Gotama. Seven days after giving birth to the Buddha, his mother died. Her sister, who was also married to King Suddhodana, replaced her to bring him up. At the age of 16, he married Princess Yasadhara, a cousin, and at the same age with him. His wife gave birth to a son. He lived a luxurious life as he himself told it. I was delicately brought up, O Pikhus, highly delicate, exceedingly delicate was my upbringing. At my father's house, lotus ponds were made, in one of them blue lotuses bloomed, in another white lotuses, and in a third red lotuses, just for my enjoyment. I used only sandal unguent from Banaras and my headdress, my jacket, my undergarment, and my tunic were made of Banaras muslin. By day and night a white canopy was held over me, lest cold and heat, chaff, or dew should trouble me. I had three palaces, one for the summer, one for the winter and one for the rainy season. In the palace for the rainy season, during the four months of rains, I was waited upon by female musicians only, and I did not come down from the palace during these months. While in other people's homes servants and slaves receive a meal of broken rice together with sour gruel, in my father's house they were given choice rice and meat. Why, at the age of 29, did he choose homelessness over the house life? The answer can be found in the great discourse on the lineage. In this discourse the Buddha told the reason why the Buddha Vipassi had gone forth. 91 eons ago, as he was being driven by his charioteer to the pleasure park, Prince Vipassi saw an aged man, bent like a roof beam, broken, leaning on a stick, tottering, sick, his youth all vanished. Another time, as he was being driven by his charioteer to the pleasure park, Prince Vipassi saw a sick man, suffering, very ill, fallen to his own urine and excrement, and some people were picking him up, and others putting him to bed. And another time, as he was being driven by his charioteer to the pleasure park, Prince Vipassi saw a large crowd collecting, clad in many colors, and carrying a beer, and he saw the corpse of the dead man, whom his parents and other relatives would not see again and who would not see them again. Prince Vipassi was overcome with grief and dejection, crying, shame on this thing birth, since whoever is born is subject to aging, to sickness, and to death. Another day, as he was being driven by his charioteer to the pleasure park, Prince Vipassi saw a shaven-headed man, one who had gone forth, wearing a yellow robe. Prince Vipassi asked about one who had gone forth and was told, one who has gone forth was one who truly follows the Dhamma, who truly lives in serenity, does good actions, performs meritorious deeds, is harmless and truly has compassion for living beings. Having heard that, Prince Vipassi told the charioteer to take the carriage and drive back to the palace alone. He himself stayed there, shaved off his hair and beard, put on yellow robes, and went forth from the household life into homelessness. When living a secluded life, Prince Vipassi thought, this world, also, is in a sorry state, there is birth and aging, there is death and falling into other states and being reborn. And no one knows any way of escape from this suffering, this aging, and death. So Prince Vipassi lived a secluded life to seek an unknown deliverance from aging and death. The Buddha told the story of the reason why Prince Vipassi had gone forth from the house life into homelessness. 
It was also the reason why the Buddha left home to live a secluded life, seeking the deliverance from suffering, especially from aging and death. Continuing the story about his luxurious life, the Buddha told, Amidst such splendor and an entirely carefree life, O Pikhus, this thought came to me, an instructed worldling, though sure to become old himself and unable to escape aging, feels repelled, humiliated and disgusted when seeing an old and decrepit person, being forgetful of his situation. Now I too am sure to become old and cannot escape aging. If, when seeing an old and decrepit person, I were to feel repelled, humiliated, or disgusted, that would not be proper for one like myself. When I reflected thus, Hikhus, all my pride in youthfulness vanished. Again I reflected, an instructed worldling, though sure to become ill himself and unable to escape illness, feels repelled, humiliated and disgusted when seeing a sick person, being forgetful of his situation. Now I too am sure to become ill and cannot escape illness. If, when seeing a sick person, I were to feel repelled, humiliated, or disgusted, that would not be proper for one like myself. When I reflected thus, Hikhus, all my pride in health vanished. Again I reflected, an instructed worldling, though sure to die himself and unable to escape death, feels repelled, humiliated and disgusted when seeing a dead person, being forgetful of his situation. Now I too am sure to die and cannot escape death. If, when seeing a dead person, I were to feel repelled, humiliated, or disgusted, that would not be proper for one like myself. When I reflected thus, Hikhus, all my pride in life vanished. Therefore, while still young, a black-haired young man endowed with the blessing of youth, in the prime of life, though his mother and father wished otherwise and wept with tearful faces, the Buddha shaved off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and went forth from the home life into homelessness, in search of what is wholesome, seeking the unaging, the unailing, and the deathless, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, set on the way to seek the cessation of aging, of illness, and of death. After six years of recluseship, the Buddha attained deliverance. When becoming enlightened, he knew what suffering is and what the cessation of suffering is. And in his 45 years of his teaching he taught what suffering is and what the cessation of suffering is. He said to Anuraga, Good, good, Aranatta. Formerly, Aranatta, and also now, I make known just suffering and the cessation of suffering. The word Nibbana means no craving, craving, as we see later, leads to suffering, so Nibbana means the cessation of suffering. The Buddha said to the wandering ascetic Uttaya, having directly known it, Uttaya, I have taught the Dhamma to my disciples for the purification of beings, for getting beyond sorrow and lamentation, for the ending of pain and grief, for attaining to the method of liberation and for realizing Nibbana. Section 2. Is the cessation of suffering in this life or is it in the next life? The question, is the cessation of suffering in this life or is it in the next life, is raised because the cessation of suffering is often understood to be in the next life. The Buddha was enlightened and so after death he entered Nibbana and was not born again in the round of births and deaths, in the round of suffering. Therefore Nibbana in the next life is the ultimate goal of his followers. But are the Buddha's teachings about the next life? In Tuvakagata on fire the Buddha said that he did not teach, 1. After death, a Tathagata exists, 2. After death, a Tathagata does not exist, 3. After death, a Tathagata both exists and does not exist and, 4. After death, a Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist. Briefly, he did not teach the rebirth in the afterlife. How is it? Master Gotama, does Master Gotama hold the view, 
after death the Tathagata exists, only this is true, anything else is wrong. Vakha, I do not hold the view, after death the Tathagata exists, only this is true, anything else is wrong. How is it, Master Gotama? Does Master Gotama hold the view, after death the Tathagata does not exist, only this is true, anything else is wrong. Vakha. I do not hold the view, after death the Tathagata does not exist, only this is true, anything else is wrong. How is it, Master Gotama? Does Master Gotama hold the view, after death the Tathagata both exists and does not exist, only this is true, anything else is wrong. Vakha. I do not hold the view, after death the Tathagata both exists and does not exist, only this is true, anything else is wrong. How is it, Master Gotama? Does Master Gotama hold the view, after death the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist, only this is true, anything else is wrong. Vakha. I do not hold the view, after death the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist, only this is true, anything else is wrong. Why did he not talk about the next life? It is possible to say that he, as a human being, saw truth in this life. If he talked about the next life, he did it in guessing, according to his faith. He said that the Tathagata was not apprehended as real and actual in this very life, let alone the Tathagata in the next life. But, Anuradha, when the Tathagata is not apprehended by you as real and actual here in this very life, is it fitting for you to declare, friends, when a Tathagata is describing a Tathagata, the highest type of person, the Supreme Person, the attainer of the Supreme Attainment, he describes him apart from these four cases, the Tathagata exists after death or the Tathagata does not exist after death, or the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death. Or the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death. The body does not make a Tathagata, but a Tathagata is not one who is without the body. The Buddha taught the summary and exposition of a single excellent night. Let not a person revive the past. Or on the future build his hopes. For the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead with insight let him see each presently arisen state. Let him know that and be sure of it. Invincibly, unshakably. Today the effort must be made. Tomorrow death may come, who knows. No bargain with mortality can keep him and his hordes away. But one who dwells thus ardently relentlessly, by day, by night. It is he, the peaceful sage has said, who has had a single excellent night. The Buddha taught the cessation of suffering and happiness here and now. Here and now denotes the present which is contrary to the past and the future. The past is the past life, and the future the future life. So, for the Buddha, to live amongst life is not to seek a blissful realm after death, such a search often asks for the sacrifice of this life. For the Buddha, one becomes a monk because a secluded life is happier than a house life. The Buddha himself confirmed that in his recluseship he was happier than a king. Following is the conversation between the Buddha and the venerable Nikahas about who abides in greater pleasure, King Sini Yabim Bizara of Magadha or the Venerable Gotama. Then, friends, I shall ask you a question in return. Answer it as you like. What do you think, friends? Can King Sini Yabim Bizara of Magadha abide without moving his body or uttering a word, experiencing the peak of pleasure for seven days and nights? No, friend. Can King Sini Yabim Bizara of Magadha abide without moving his body or uttering a word, experiencing the peak of pleasure for six, five, four, three, or two days and nights? Even for one day and night? 
No, friend. But, friends, I can abide without moving my body or uttering a word, experiencing the peak of pleasure for one day and night, for two, three, four, six days and nights, for seven days and nights. What do you think, friends, that being so, who dwells in greater pleasure, King Sina Yabim Visara of Magadha or I? That being so, the Venerable Gotama abides in greater pleasure than King Sina Yabim Visara of Magadha. Therefore to become a monk is not to sacrifice this life and to seek a blissful life after death at some place in the sky. One becomes a monk because one sees that a secluded life is happier than a house life. In the same way, if we follow the way, we do not sacrifice this life to seek a blissful life after death someplace in the sky. We follow the way because we see that a holy life is happier than a profane one. A happy life takes place here and now, and a blissful life after death, if there is, is only an inevitable result. But is what we just said contrary to the notion of Nibbana? Is Nibbana not something that will take place after death? Even though the Buddha talked about Nibbana with the residue left or Nibbana in this life, is it not true that Nibbana with no residue or final Nibbana or Nibbana after death is the ultimate goal of the holy life? The Atibhateka talks about two aspects of Nibbana, Nibbana aspect with the groups of existence still remaining and Nibbana aspect with no more groups of existence still remaining. Nyanatilakathera interprets Nibbana aspect with the groups of existence still remaining as Nibbana attained in this life and Nibbana aspect with no more groups of existence still remaining as Nibbana after death. Mahathera Narada has the same interpretation, Nibbana in this very life and Nibbana in a life beyond. Pikhu Amali translates with the meaning that Nibbana in both aspects is attained in this very life. In general introduction of his translation connected discourses of the Buddha Bhikkhu Bodhi says that the Nibbana element without residue can indicate Nibbana at death or Nibbana in this life. The Nibbana element without residue really indicates Nibbana after death, for example when the Buddha passed away, but it also indicates Nibbana in this life. With residue denotes the incomplete cessation of this shore, the five aggregates, and without residue the complete cessation of this shore. It is possible to say that Nibbana with residue is Nibbana of the social life and Nibbana without residues is Nibbana in the stillness of meditation. The Buddha himself was sometimes in Nibbana with residue and sometimes in Nibbana without residue. Therefore with residue and without residue are two aspects of Nibbana. Even in the next life a person can attain Nibbana with residue or Nibbana without residue. So Nibbana, even if it is Nibbana without residue, does not indicate only something in the next life and should not be used to interpret that the Buddha taught the sphere of bliss after death. The Buddha taught only suffering and the cessation of suffering here and now. People also talk about Nibbana and final Nibbana, Parinibbana. The term final Nibbana often refers to Nibbana attained after death, for example when the Buddha passed away, he entered final Nibbana. But we have said that the Buddha did not teach about the Tathagata after death. So what is final Nibbana? Final Nibbana is Nibbana attained the last time, there is no more rebirth into this shore. In other words, it happens when one has reached the other shore and will stay there forever. The Buddha attained final Nibbana when he was living and of course he stayed there after death. So final Nibbana is Nibbana without residue. Because when he was living, he still had a body and therefore it is interpreted that he did not enter final Nibbana and lived with Nibbana with residue, and that only when he passed away or he did not have a body, he entered final Nibbana. Bhikkhu Bodhi writes, in popular books on Buddhism, Nibbana plain and simple is often taken to mean Nibbana as experienced in life, Parinibbana Nibbana attained at death. This is a misinterpretation. Both terms signify Nibbana in this life with Pari converting a verb from expression of a state into the expression of the achievement of an action.